and the divine decree of Allah. As we talked about last lesson, in some of the athar or the narrations we discuss, especially on the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, as we said this a couple of lessons ago, as you mentioned, in, he said in that tremendous statement. <coughs> As he said in that tremendous statement, verily patience is from faith. Or patience is from faith. He said, like the level of how the head is to the body. Then he raised his voice and said, there's no iman for the person that doesn't have any patience. So you notice that the great Khalifa Tarashid, the one who's been promised paradise, and the fourth successor, from those who've been promised paradise and the great com companions of the Messenger of Allah who's named Ali ibn Abi Talib said there's no iman, there's no faith for the one who has no patience. What type of negation of faith here? What is it pertaining to everyone? Was it pertaining to the origin of faith or is it pertaining to the completeness of faith? Here in this particular adhar, it could mean both. It could mean both. Why well, I say that? <clears throat> because patience requires, or patience is required in every affair of the religion. And the greatest of all affairs is the Tawheed of Allah. You'll find that even Ahl Ilm mentioned and said that the people fall into polytheism. You'll find that due to their impatience, their impatience is what led them to falling into polytheism. Stop biting your finger. That their impatience is what led them into falling into polytheism. You see, for example, you'll find that certain things happen to certain people, certain, th certain things that took place in their lives, and they, want, they hasten towards having it, having that relief for what they're facing of certain things that are taking place in their life where they're under severe difficulties that they're facing. And what they do is, out of hastiness, what they'll do, he said, they'll try to look for a way out. And then you'll find that what they utilize in order to now, so-called, relieve themselves of that affair that is weighing heavy upon them, what will they do? They will hurry to, to, to look for a solution. Then they'll look so what they seem to be what effective and then as a result of it you'll find that they fall into polytheism and I'll bring the other with the great Imam Sheikh Muhammad Ahmad Jami he even mentioned this this tremendous point he said you'll find that the reason of why people even fall into polytheism also is connected with the lack of patience he said it has a, is a strong point what is connected with the lack of patience so here based upon this other the negation of Iman by Ali ibn Abi Talib could be what? The origin of faith. Because you'll find that polytheism also is connected with the lack of patience. You'll find that. And we'll mention it, I'll give it the other, the information with the great Iman mentioned later. And patience is required for every aspect of life you can think of. Even in your worldly affairs, even in your religious affairs. Patience is, and even in your personal life. Is there anything you can think of what you do not need patience for that is very important in your life, whether it be worldly or religiously? Except that you need patience with it. Whether it be a performance of prayer, what if it be attaining knowledge, you need patience. Whether it be standing at night in prayer, and, and, and we know during the month of Ramadan, it's called what? The month of what, everyone? The month of patience. Why? Because patience too, truly manifests in the state of fasting. That's why you'll find that they call it what? The month of sabr. Shahr al-sabr. Why do you think they call month of Ramadan the month of patience? Because the month and that blessed month truly manifests the reality of one's patience. Where he abstains from food and drink and all what he desires. In order for that person to attain that tremendous reward. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gave 
that tremendous reward as a result of one remaining patience during those times. He's abstaining from all those matters in which the law may prohibit it. And that's why that reward is given, or why that reward is at, this, at that tremendous level. Due to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Verily, Siyam is for me, and I will what? Repay by it. Because he left off his food and his drink and his desires sincerely for me. And no one knows the true reality of the one fasting except Allah. That's the reason why the month of Ramadan is called what everyone? The month of patience. So that is another tremendous affair of worship that requires patience. Also, when you embark it upon calling to Allah and calling to what's correct, you need what? You need patience. When you command the good and forbid the evil, what do you need? You need patience. You're going to receive harm, more than likely. From, from when you're establishing the truth and you're calling to the good and prohibiting the evil, more than likely there's going to be some type of what? Harm or something might happen. At least where someone might insult you or someone will speak ill about you or someone might defame you or someone try, might try to whoop your reputation to the end of the harm that comes in the way of calling to the correct methodology and the correct belief. All of these affairs requires what, everyone? Patience. In regards to now your family, your family with your wife, what do you need? When you're raising your children, what do you need? And the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. That's the reason why you'll find that the great Imam Ali ibn Talib said this tremendous other, or this tremendous statement, this other, excuse me. He said, of course, that patience from Iman is like the head of the body. And he raised his voice and said, there's no Iman for the one who has no patience. And we said that in this particular other, that it can mean, it can mean the negation of what? The origin of faith or it can mean what? Completeness of faith. Because we said, number one, of what allowed people to fall into polytheism, of what the uh, imma of Ahl Ilm mentioned, he said, for the, one of the reasons why people fell into polytheism is because of impatience. He says, it has a direct connection with impatience. So that's the negation of the origin of faith. And then we know, in regards for a person not carrying out his duties or his mandatory duties that Allah has obliged upon him correctly, for him to do that in the most perfect manner or acceptable manner, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it, then he needs to have patience when he stands out of it or forsakes his bed in order to perform wudu, to get up when he's in a state where he's tired, he's exhausted, forsaking his bed to seek the reward with Allah, all that regard requires what? Patience. Commanded the good, forbidden the evil, to the end of what we said of the utmost of important affairs requires patience from the individual. That's the reason why you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we mentioned, said, mentioned patience in 90 places, as the Imam Ahmed mentions in the other. When Imam Ahmed had mentioned, he said, <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> mentions patience in 90 places in the Quran to let you know what, how important it is. إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ to the end of the ayat, is to the end of the ayat. You can go on and on and on and on. It's 90, 90 ayat. Take your pick. Take your pick of which ayat and which verse in the book of Allah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the importance of what? Patience. Even when we're raising our children, even when we're cultivating them, even when we're teaching our youth, you need, you need patience. They're going to do things that might irritate you. You need patience. Things that even, even we need patience with our own what? Our own friends. We need patience. People these days live a what? They live an unrealistic, or they have these high expectations about people around them, thinking they're never going to make a mistake, or thinking that they're never going to do something wrong. All of our loved ones who are dear to us and closest to us, they make mistakes. Our fathers, our mothers, sisters, brothers, children, you name it, and ourselves. We've made mistakes. we made mistakes that requires and we want from our loved ones to what? Pardon us. And to have what? Patience with us. That's part of life. And that's part of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Quran because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his infinite knowledge that he knows that the human being is going to make what? He's going to have slip ups, mistakes to the end of it. That's the reason why he emphasized the importance of patience where it's mentioned in the Quran 90 times. Due to the fact that Allah's infinite knowledge, he knows human beings are going to what? Slip. 
and that human beings are going to what? They're going to have little mishaps. They're going to slip up. They're going to what? They're not perfect. So it requires for each other to be what? Patient with one, patience with one another. As Allah says in his book, like that, 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 that we made you a fitna for one another, will you be patient? Will you, we made you a fitna for one another, try for one another. Will you be patient? Have patience with, with each other. In certain affairs that we can tolerate, but not in those affairs that, are, that cannot be what? Tolerated or they cannot be compromised, such as the affairs of the usul of Ahl Sunnah or the belief system. But other than that, for certain matters, as far as in cultivation, our children, our families, our loved ones, our friends, they're all going to do certain things that might irritate us from time to time, and it requires what? It requires patience. Fine. So we mentioned, a, we covered these, these affairs about this other, of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the great Khalifa al Rashid. And then now, as we stop to the other, the tremendous statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, rather, we finish that. No. We'll go over it again. What Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that he mentioned is said, Marfu'an, that the Prophet said, and this is where we stopped at, He is not from us who hits or strikes his cheeks. Laysa minna man darb al khudud wa shaqqa al juyub wa da'a bi da'wa al jahiliya. You need patience to get you to stop banging your neck. <laughs> He is not from us who strikes his cheeks and rips his garments. How do they translate in your books by, out of curiosity? How do they? Tears his garments? Gee. What does it say? Strikes his cheeks. No, I'm talking about the, the clothes. What is it? Tears his garments. Gee. He is not from amongst us, or he's not from us who strikes his cheeks or tears his garments, and he calls the calling of of jahiliyyah, of pre-Islamic ignorance. <clears throat> As we said, the whole chapter revolves around what, everyone? Around patience upon what? Just not patience, it's not chapter of sabr, but it's patience upon what specifically? The qadr, the divine decree. I don't want everyone to lose track of why we're discussing this chapter. So it says, he's not from, us, not from us who strikes his cheeks. Striking your cheeks at the time of what, everyone? At the time when something happens, something tremendous happens in one's life where they lose a loved one. Or, because if you look in the other before, what does it say? In the authority of Abu Huraira, what does it say? That, no, no, two qualities among, within the people, he said that it, it will be considered disbelief, which is to make disparagement or defame one's lineage and to wail over the what? The dead. Then you have this, well, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great Sahabi, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud ibn Ghaf al Hudali, that he said, He is not from us who strikes his cheeks. Meaning at the time, of course, something. Tremendous happens in one's life. Something very difficult where you lost a loved one. It must not, it's not even during the time of death. Even it could be something drastic happen. Where maybe of a car accident or anything drastic that might happen in your life. And to show your discontent before Allah and his d divine decree, you strike your face. But the whole point of the illa, the whole point of why we're mentioning this is, is one, the showing his discontentment for the divine decree of Allah and the affair was considered, it's considered what? A fa'al, the actions. When one displays their discontentment for Allah's divine decree in their actions. And by one displaying his hatred or discontentment for Allah's divine decree in one's actions, the example of it is mentioned here in this narration. Where one strikes their face. Is it just specifically for the face, everyone? Or it can be anywhere on the body? If the intention behind it of what one shows or manifests is what? 
showing their disgust or their discontentment for what Allah has decreed. So it's not just specifically for striking the face. And then a person can say, well, it says here, strike the face. So maybe if I hit, go like this, or might hit my arm, or, or, or strike the table like this, oh, I didn't say that. No. Anything that displays where your intent, of course, was to dis show your disgust for what Allah has destined to happen. And it's not necessarily restricted to striking the cheeks. If what was intended for me to strike in the table, someone, something, something happened, man, you understand? But if, it, if that was the reason why you hit or struck or threw something, man, this microphone. <laughs> in order to show or to manifest your what? Your hatred for what Allah has decreed, then it still falls under this what? Under the prohibition. It still falls under the prohibition. So he said, it's not from us who strikes their cheeks or rips their clothes. These are all amthila. They're all examples. But the intent is to show what? Any, generally for showing any type of what? Discontent before Allah's decree. And it's not just restricted here. Rather, what is intended in this particular narration is just giving us what, everyone? It's giving us what? Giving us examples. Of that was mentioned in the narration. Focus on the book. Focus on the book. Out of the examples that we're given, what was mentioned here is not restricted to what the message of Allah mentioned. Rather, it was just given what they call examples. But however, the illa or the reason, if it's the same in which a person does a particular act, where you want to show your discontent before what Allah's decree, then it still falls under the same what? Prohibition. Is it clear or is it not clear? Fine. So it says, who also calls to the calling of Jahiliyyah. And like we said, the call of Jahiliyyah is comprehensive for a lot of affairs. From those affairs that Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah mentioned, it said the call of Jahiliyyah, he said, was to wail over the dead. Nedbul mayit, nudba, which is wailing over the dead. He said that is also a call of Jahiliyyah. Because this was something they used to, were, were acclimated to doing before Islam came in order to eradicate this type of behavior. At the time when one loses their loved one or, some dear to, or someone dear to them or closest to them. So Shaykh al-Islam mentioned and said here about this particular part of the, of the hadith. What Shaykh al-Islam said, what was intended, one of the, the things that are intended here, he says, is to wail over the dead or wailing over the dead. Some of them said, invoking one's destruction due to their loved one that they might have lost or something devastating happened or traumatic might have happened and they'll now make all this this type of wailing or, or, or if you want to say invocation of destruction oh woe is me oh why couldn't it be me you understand so also that was intended that the hadith is what this type of wailing or this type of what? Invocation of destruction, or raising one's voice. And as they say, make a dua bil wayli with thubur. We're saying woe and also thubur, meaning the invoking of one's destruction to the end of it. So that's what Shaykh al-Islam said, what was intended by when the Messenger of Allah said at the end of the hadith. What did he say? The one who calls the calling of what? Jahiliyyah. Well, that's just one of the meanings. That's just one of the meanings. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions what we said last class. Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned what we said last class. He said the call, the call, the call of Jahiriyyah, he says, for example, when one calls some, to some blind fanaticism to their tribe, to their qaba'il, to their tribe, or some blind fanaticism, even though they're wrong, you still defend them based upon some type of blind so-called love where you just want to defend them even though you know that they're what? They're wrong. Or they're your family. I know they're wrong, but still, they're my loved ones and I'm going to defend them regardless. I don't care what it, I don't care what the circumstances. Excuse me. So one, call it to some fanaticism to, clint, to blindly cling to their family or their tribe or anyone, whether it be from their country, their land, 
their background, they're from South Side, I'm from North Side, I hate them. But they say, I don't care, from North Side, I'm from South Side. That's from the call of Jahiliyyah. And the Prophet said that that individual is not what? From us. And we know from the Kaba'ir, as we discussed last class, from the major sins, is those affairs you'll find in which the Messenger of Allah mentioned where he, what? Where he set himself free from the individual. For any narration you'll find in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he, where he showed that I'm free from so-and-so or, or that whoever does such and such that I'm not from him or they're not from me, those narrations are considered or those type of sin, or sins are considered from the major sins. Where the Messenger of Allah set himself free from the one who did it. Here in this narration, the Messenger of Allah set himself free from the one who caused the calling of what? Jahiliyyah. Which lets you know, it's a, which, is a, which is a clear indication of what everyone, that this affair is considered from the kaba'ir, from the major sins. That's the reason why, as, we, as Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, it says, the person who calls to blind fanaticism to their tribe, or to their family, or to their nationality, or any of affair that's connected in this regard, for example, like I just said a couple of minutes ago, I'm from South Side, you from North Side, I hate you. We're going to always have beef because you're from that street. That, those are all calls of the call of Jahiliyyah, in which the Messenger of Allah set himself free from those individuals. Is it clear or not clear? For in, in regards to now, gang wars, or now, like we said, looking upon or looking down upon someone, Consider that they're inferior or that you're superior over them because of your nationality or your color or your background or your skin color or your, or your height or your weight. All these are the affairs of what? From the cause of the call of Jahiliyyah, which the Messenger of Allah highly condemned. Highly condemned. In which he set himself free from the people who what? Called to this type of call. Because all these affairs in which the Messenger of Allah came to eradicate, decimate from its origin. So the people could be what? Loving and caring for one another. And that the only way that one could be superior over another is based upon their fear of Allah to be with the Allah and how much they implement the truth in their lives and they also call to it. So Ibn al-Qayyim says in this particular narration, he said, Listen to this point that Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned. It says, he says, the call of call of Jahiliyyah, similar to what the Muslims do in their blind fanaticism, blind fanaticism in their affair, in these affairs of fiqh. <laughs> this is what he says. وَمِثْلُهُ التَّعَصُّبْ إِلَى الْمَذَاهِبِ وَالطَّوَائِفْ وَالْمَشَايِخِ he said that blind fanaticism of madahib in regards to fiqh of those who followed different madahib, or fiqh al Hanbali, or fiqh of Abi, Abi Hanif al Hanafi, or al Maliki, or Shafi'i, blind follow and clinging to those affairs out of, out of blind fanaticism with no type of, of, of evidence from Kitab and Sunnah that substantiates that affair. Which if there's no evidence and proof, if it comes to you, you say Allah and His Messenger says, and you say, for example, the Imam Ahmed said such and such, or the Imam Malik said such and such, then you'll find, like we said in this regard, they have fell into what the message of Allah has what? Has prohibited. Not to cling to people's statements based upon the fact that you have some blind fanaticism for their statement. But however, we know that the Imam Ahmed, the Imam Shafi'i, the Imam Malik, and all of the great imma, that everything that what they're upon of actually what made them imams was what everyone in the first place was them following the kitab al-sunnah. If it wasn't for Allah and kitab al-sunnah, there wouldn't, green, there wouldn't be no uh, imat al-arba. There wouldn't be no four great imams in the first place. So the great gave them, gave them their status ultimately is what everyone? It's kitab al-sunnah. That's the reason why they told everyone to what? If you find my statement opposed what Allah and His Messenger say, then what? Take my statement and throw it against the wall. Take what Allah and His Messenger said. There wouldn't be any a'imma or ulama if it wasn't for Allah in, this, in, this, in, the, in the religion of Kitab al Sunnah. So, this is what Ibn al Qayyim mentions it says. He says, blind fanaticism to what? To the different madahib in the different groups of the different sects and blind following 
of those what? Those so-called mashayikh. And then you'll find that them, that them raising some over others based upon this type of call. Just blind fanaticism. So Ibn al-Qayyim goes on to say about this type of call, jahiliyyah. He says, يَدْعُوا إِلَى ذَلِكَ وَيُوَالِ عَلَيْهِ وَيُعَادِي فَكُلُّ هَذَا مِنْ دَعْوَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ he said, for those who call to this, he says, and now, they, cut, they unite upon it. And they take his, en his enemies upon it. He said, for all of these affairs in which we mentioned, if you call to say that I'm with you because you're black, or I'm with you, we're with this group because we're white, or I'm with this group because they're from South Philly, or they're from the east side or the west side of Delaware, I'm with you because you're from the west side. These are all the calls in which, Shaykh, uh, which Ibn al-Qayyim is mentioned here. And the, the affairs of blind fanaticism in regards to fiqh, all are connected with this one wording that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, who calls the call of what? Jahiliyyah. Also those who call to what? Nationalism. That I'm from this country, you're from that country, I'm superior, you're inferior. You're nothing to me because you're from such and such land. Or you're nothing to me because you're such and such nationality. And it's known about your nationality, you're a bunch of people who are, uh, are ignorant and foul people that don't care about such and such affairs of family, to the end of what they mentioned. Oh, we know about black people. You black people, y'all, we you know, we know that you guys are y'all, you guys uh, are animals. Let's know about Pakistanis, you know, they they have always this nasty smell. It's, it's always known about the, the Arab over there, you know, the, especially in certain countries, you know about those guys, you know how they buck wild. In certain affairs you'll find that they mentioned, which is like we said, all of these affairs are prohibited highly. They are prohibited. For the message of Allah Sallallahu he called, and, or excuse me, that he prohibited this call of Jahiliyyah, and he condemned it to the point where we said that he set himself free from the one who calls to these, these matters. These condemned, vilified, this praiseworthy matters which has destroyed the societies and destroyed people in general. And I think it's self-explanatory all over the world of why you'll find division amongst people based upon all of what we just mentioned. So-and-so is not from such and such tribe. So-and-so is not from such and such side of the, of the area or the street. So-and-so is not from such and such street. So-and-so is not light-skinned. So-and-so is not dark-skinned. So-and-so doesn't have curly hair. So-and-so has, so -and -so has coarse hair. So-and-so is not Hanafi. I'm Shafi'i, he's Hanafi. So I would never marry my daughter to him because he's Shafi'i. To the end of it. Is it clear, everyone? I would never marry my daughter off to such and such because he's from such and such tribe. I would never marry my daughter off to him because he's black. I would never marry my daughter off to him because he has coarse hair. Or I would never marry my daughter off because he's, his height is like this. Or he's overweight. Or to the end of the nonsense in which you'll find that people, that they call to these matters, and you'll find that they unify upon them, or they disunify each other based upon it. Or they declare as an enemy based upon these matters. Which is all from the affairs of what? Shaitan. Shaitan was the first one who, who, who now claimed himself to be superior and dominant based upon the element in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him to look down upon Adam or the children of Adam based upon how he was created or the element in which he was created. So the first person that called to this called Jahiliyyah and who called to this way to think he was dominant or superior over someone based upon how he is was Shaitan. Where he clearly said in the in 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 ayah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ana khayrun min, khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtuhu min tlin. I'm better than him. You created, well, you created me from what? Fire, you created him from what? Clay. So I'm superior, and he's what? Inferior. Why would you make me prostrate to him? In which you'll find that Al-Ilm say that even Shaitan himself improperly used his intellect. Because even from that, from that affair, that aspect of the intellect, he still was wrong. If you get to the nitty gritty of what, why he so called looked down upon Adam based upon the, in the nature of how he was created. That you'll find that they even said he was still wrong. In which we get to the statements of that, which I'm not going to talk about right now. But one of those statements you'll find they say that first of all, fire is light. It's light. And it burns. It's coarse. It's coarse and it burns. So it has no sedateness. Whereas clay, it can hold itself together. 
and it has, has some type of stability. So even from the aspect of the aql, he was still wrong. So he shows when you, when you become belligerent and arrogant and haughty, how you lose your what? You lose your common sense. How jealousy and envy and belligerence and haughtiness and arrogance can render the most intelligent of people what? Stupid. With the dumbest logic and reasoning that they try to utilize to justify what they're saying. And then when you contemplate and show them, what you're saying is still wrong. Even though you think you're so-called highly sophisticated in your intelligence. Especially in, in regards to going against the wahi, the revelation of Allah, tabarik wa ta'ala. That you use, use your rationality in order to oppose and reject what Allah, tabarik wa ta'ala, had commanded you to do by not just submitting and knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infinite, complete knowledge in every aspect and just submitting to his command instead of trying to rationalize and using your what? Your intellect to justify your evil. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Jay. So you'll find, like we said, the call of Jahiliya, the originator of the one who called to this call was who? Shaitan. It's Iblis. So that's the reason why these fears are highly what? Condemned and vilified. Is it clear? G. So that's why in the narration you will find that Ibn al Qayyim said this tremendous benefit of the calls of Qahid Jahiliya. And also you'll find that that tremendous other, or excuse me, this part of the hadith refutes from those deviant sects of those who call to white nationalism, black nationalism, Arab nationalism, whatever nationalism, of what color and what nationality is, it does not matter. It is all wrong without any exception. Black nationalism, white nationalism, Arab nationalism, all of it is 100% wrong. And all of them are used, are combating falsehood in order to combat falsehood. You cannot fight with wrong with another wrong. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? G. So now if you look to the next other, as it says, if you look in your books, I forgot, I forgot to give you, oh, someone who called you in there for me? Amir. I'm sorry. It came in about 820. Oh, what? Oh, sorry. That's bad. That's bad. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> so you'll find that all these matters have been highly condemned and they're from the cause of Jahiliya. When people used to scream over the dead and wail and make some type of declaration of their ruin or doom or destruction 
I'm showing their grief due to their affliction. All these affairs were, were from the pre-Islamic days of Jahiliyyah, in which the Messenger of Allah came to remove. Because the, one of the reasons, like we said, is because it displayed what everyone discontentment for the divine decree of Allah. Why is discontent for the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considered from the kabair if one is not careful? If it, if it leads to shirk, then it's something different. But in its origin, the asal of this, these matters is considered from the major sins. And it shows this, the one's discontentment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being one's Lord. Keep in mind as we discuss any affair that's connected with the qadr, the divine decree of Allah, auto, automatically your mind should turn to what? The rububi of Allah. As soon as you hear qadr, your mind should switch to what? The lordship of Allah. The lordship of Allah. And that we know that one, when he comes to the religion, then he, he's pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being his lord. However, when you fall into these matters which have been mentioned, in this, these narrations which we've been discussing, it shows that your, your discontent as, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being your Lord. Because He's the one that allowed these affairs to what? To happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear in this book as we discussed, where He says, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ مَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ That's one ayah. He says, nothing afflicts you of an affliction is in the earth or within yourselves except it's in the book. Meaning, 50,000 years before Allah created the heavens and the earth and he decreed that this matter will what? It will happen. There's another ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَصَبَكُمْ مَا أَصَبَكُمْ مَا أَصَبَكُمْ مَا أَصَبَكُمْ مَا And that's the ayah which is in your book here, everyone. That there's no affliction that afflicts you except that it happens or Allah afflicts the people by it. فَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ As it says in the ayah which is in your book. The full ayah, the full context of the ayah is like this. There's nothing that afflicts you of affliction except by the permission of Allah. The permission of Allah, as we know, بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ الْكَوْنِ The permission of Allah, what Allah allows to happen by His permission in its existence of good and evil. All of these affairs are connected with his what? Rububiya. And when you display these matters of discontentment, whether it be verbally or your actions, then it shows you truly have not what? Accepted Allah as your Lord. Because none of these affairs happen except we mention the ayat. Allah says in one ayat, these affairs take place of good and evil, what we perceive, except by his permission. And in one ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the other one, what to say everyone? Except it was, it was where, it was where everyone? It was written in a book. So these matters are what we said. It was connected with the, the affairs of the divine decree of Allah Tabiri wa Ta'ala is from the secrets of Allah. The secrets of Allah Tabiri wa Ta'ala, which we'll discuss, we have the time in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not reveal it to anyone. Especially after the revelation has been sealed and shut these affairs of the Qadr and even the prophets and the messenger Mustafa even the prophets and the messengers did not have what they call absolute knowledge of the unseen except it was based upon what Allah had revealed to them and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gave them of certain knowledge of certain affairs but as far as in the secrets of the creation of each individual specifically what was going to happen in the future then we know they did not have knowledge of those affairs except what Allah Tabiri wa Ta'ala mentioned about them. He said, لَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبِ لَاسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَإِشْ وَمَا مَسَّنِي السُّ If I would have known the unseen, he said that, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sayyidina Ayah, if I have known the, of the affairs of the unseen, it's لَاسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ I would take advantage of all good. I would take the initiative and the, and the benefits that's in front of me that I could utilize. Because I know the unseen now. Or some evil I could prevent it or ward it off from happening. Because I have knowledge of the unseen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a knowledge of all these matters. Of what takes place in our lives individually. They're from the secrets of Allah. 
in which you'll find that they say, from the Salaf, and I think it's from what I mentioned as Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said that the Qadr of Allah is Sirullah fi Khalqi. It's the secret of Allah amongst His creation, and no one tries to look for the secrets of Allah except He will be destroyed. Sirullah fi Khalqi. And whoever tries to look for the secrets of Allah to be with the Allah, He will be destroyed. And from those ways you'll find, like we said, you'll, you'll find people trying to look for the secrets of Allah. By saying the statements, for example, like we said before, those who mention the statements, I don't believe God is perfect. Why? So why is it that, you know, certain countries where, where there was hurricanes and people who were poor, they, they had those, uh, those, di- those type of droughts, or, or those, their lands became destroyed by certain things that took place and they were innocent people nice people i don't believe god is all good i don't believe that why had to be people who are destitute people who weren't who weren't well off why they had to be destroyed why is it that rich people they're the ones that seem like they always get the benefit of a doubt they're the ones that seem like they want they're the ones that always get the uh, the, they give the advantage, given the advantage, or they give it longevity. They give it so many chances, and then people in certain lands, why they have to seem like they just gave, they just received the short end of the stick? Why did their lands become destroyed? For these matters are considered from the what everyone, the secrets of, the, of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, in which He does not reveal to anyone, except that He will be destroyed, and the affairs in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has revealed to us of why he allows certain affairs to happen, as we gave the examples of last class. There's no way that people can attain tremendous lofty rewards of the hereafter, except by facing the little bit of trials here that take place in the earth that is only momentarily. It's only, mom- it's only uh, for a split second, it's momentary, and then next in the, here, in the hereafter, then what? Then the re- tremendous reward in comparison to what they will see in the hereafter, once they receive that tremendous reward, then when he discusses and said, whatever you want, they'll forget all about the difficulties they had in their life in this dunya. But however, the affair returns back to what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said here, whatever you want. If Allah wants for his slave good, what does it say it's right in your book? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hasten for them what? Oh. If Allah wants good for his, his, his servant, What's it say in your book? What does it say? If Allah wants good for a servant, then what? What does it say in your book? No, if he wants good for his servant, then what? He will punish him in this world. He will punish him. He will receive the punishment of this world in the dunya. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants evil for a slave, then what? He will hold back the, the he will hold it back due to that sin until it be fully repaid for it on the day of resurrection. So that's so this is some of the revelation to show the reasons of why certain things happen the way they happen. Is it clear now? People on the day of resurrection, as I said, the hadith which which also is in. Sahih al Jami, as I said last class, that the, on the day of resurrection, the people who were given well being all the time, when they see the people who would put the trial and tests, given their reward, they will wish to come back to this world, and that not only being rich to this world, that they would come back and they will be put under another what? Some more stress and more punishment. Rather, it says in the narration, they will want to come back to the dunya to be cut up due to the tremendous reward of what the people who are tested with in this world, the type of reward they will receive on the day of resurrection. These type of narrations, brothers and sisters, put in perspective to let us know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preordains certain affairs. And it puts it in perspective. So you can have the correct position to all these different callers of shaitan out here who will try to pollute your aqeed and pollute your mind about Allah. Because there's so many people I've heard this say, and they say out of their mouths that God is imperfect. Why did God allow certain things to happen this way and in this manner? And we know that, the, like we said, based upon the tremendous other 
where Ali ibn Abi Talib clearly says, the qadr of Allah is the sirr Allah fi khalqi. It's the secret of Allah within His creation. No one tries to open the door of the secrets of the Creator except you will be destroyed. From their destruction is what? These statements that I just said. God is imperfect and if He did, why was the outcome like this? Why did this person who was good, why did he have to die so early? Why did this person who's done all these different, this different service for people who were, who were poor, why did he have to be what? Why did he have to go through what he went through? Why did he have to have, this, be slighted as far as being treated? Why did they treat him so bad? To the end of it. The, the greatest question you can say that, if you want to say that, who's the, who's the greatest example of, of them all? Except the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi didn't do anything except what? Called the good. And he was, and the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasalam received, received whatever he want, the greatest of trials. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all of his sons died. All of his sons. Uncles died, mutilated, wars he's seen, loved ones killed by numbers in front of him. In battles and wars. Lost so many people who he loved. His wife died. Uncle died. Family made war with him. Tried to assassinate and attempt. Assa uh, uh, numerous assassination attempts were made on his life. Magic put on him. Poisoned his food. Did magic on him. Drove him out of his land. Isn't this the greatest example? If one wanted to use as a hujjah, so-called, wouldn't they say, look at the prophet's own messenger. Prophet Sallallahu was nothing but a righteous, upright man. Prayed that night, prayed that night, commanded people to keep the family ties, commanded people to love one another, commanded people to what? Be upright with Allah, upright with the creation. And did he not receive the most worst treatment of the people as far as with the kufar and the enemies of Islam? Until this day, they still talk evil about him. And he was the head of all, all of those who are righteous and despite of that, didn't he receive the, if you want to say, the shortest end of the stick? Don't you think that he was the one that received the shortest end of it? The message of Allah didn't have a lot of money. The message of Allah وسلم, didn't leave anything behind of, of inheritance for his family. There was nothing left of money, nothing. You can see the hikmah why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preordained that affair. For the from Ahl al why they say that? that the prophets and the messengers were not allowed to take sadaqah. So it can never be said that when he delivered his message, all he wanted was what? Money. Because it was prohibited for him to take it. So they could never use that as an argument to say that's all he wanted was money. Prestige. That was alleviated. So the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of all the people if you wanted to use an argument to say the greatest of all those who are righteous, what this man went through, anyone who deserved good of this world, it would have definitely been him. Did he have it? No. Message of Allah used to sleep upon what? Used to sleep upon leaves until it was printed in his back, until even Umar al-Khattab cried when he seen him sleeping on the floor like that. He said, you're the greatest of all prophets and messengers. You're the greatest example to humanity. The greatest of righteousness. And this is what, this is what you sleep on, this is your state. So if anyone who deserved anything of dunya, it would have definitely been him. Alayhi salatu wasalam. To the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Umm al-Khattab, he said, they are the ones that has been hasted for them the goodness of this world. Which is to let you know what everyone, that those who are good people, you'll find that in certain cases, that they're always given the short end of the stick. Due to their what? Due to the tremendous reward that Allah is going to prepare for them in the hereafter. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this world is insignificant in comparison to what we're going to embark upon once the hour is established and once our lives are over. What we're going to embark upon in the hereafter is on a whole, whole unimaginary level in comparison to the small pain we have to endure in this world. That's the reason why Allah allows certain people to go through what they go through even though they're good, upright, righteous, pure people. This is the reason. And if anyone deserved any good, it would have been the message of Allah. If anyone deserved gold and women and all of it, it would have been the message of Allah. And he didn't have it. Which is to let you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what? That if he wants something good for a person, he's going to what? Test him. Of what we perceive as evil. 
or what we perceive as being slighted or not given the full benefit so-called or not attaining the reward of, or, or the benefits that they're supposed to receive of what we perceive but not realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held these affairs back from his prophet وسلم, in order to prepare for the tremendous reward he's going to be given in the hereafter is it clear what I'm saying everyone? Jayin. So those, that's the answer to those who say, why is it always good people have to what? Have to, this has to be their state where they die. Or they always have to be talked bad about. We know the Shaykh al-Islam. Everyone knows the story why it was Shaykh al-Islam. Where did Shaykh al-Islam die, everyone? In jail. in jail. Did he die in a mansion? Did he die with a bunch of wives? With a bunch of wealth? Where did he die? He died with none of that. Where did he die, everyone? Prison. With nothing. Worldly. Clear everyone? Gee. Okay. <laughs> we read the next hadith from Naithari Anas ibn Malik. It says, Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قال, إذا أراد الله بعبده الخير عجل له العقوبة في الدنيا وإذا أراد بعبده الشر أمسك عنه بذنبه حتى يوافي به يوم القيامة. When the authority of Anas ibn Malik, that the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if Allah wants for his slave or for his servant, good. He will hasten for him the punishment in this world. Ah. Huh. He will hasten for him the punishment in this world. And if he wants for his servant evil, then what everyone? Then he will hold back of what he earned due to his sin. Until he's fully repaid on the day of resurrection. Until he's fully repaid on the day of resurrection. Type. What we wanted to also clarify, even though we said it's impermissible, as we discussed this last class, we said it's, it's still permissible to be what, everyone? It's still permissible to be, to be sad. Then to cry. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not, there's nothing wrong with crying and showing sadness and showing grief during those particular times when something happens that necessitates that. All of the narrations that we know, a hadith of the message of Allah alayhi salatu salam, even when his son Ibrahim died, and we know the narration, which is in Bukhari, where the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam was described, when the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam lost his son Ibrahim, he, says, he said this, this statement, he says, تَدْمَعُ الْعَيْنِ وَيَحْزُنُ الْقَلْبِ وَلَا نَقُولُ إِلَّا مَا يُرْضِ الرَّبِّ وَإِنَّ بِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ لَمَحْزُونُونَ Which comes in the Sahihain. He said, when the Prophet Sallallahu son died, Ibrahim, and when, for what we recall that Ibrahim died when he was an infant. He said, when he died, the Prophet Sallallahu said that the eyes weep and the heart is sad. And the heart is sad. However, we do, we do not say except what pleases our Lord. However, Ya Ibrahim, with you, we are most, from you departing and leaving us, we are most definitely what? Sad. So the message of Allah وسلم, wept, cried when he lost his son. So it shows the permissibility that's Tears and sadness and grief does not is not considered from discontentment in the qadr. Is it clear, everyone? Does not consider discontentment for the qadr. Rather, you'll find that that affair is what is definitely from those matters that are legislated, in which the message of Allah sallallahu he himself had what had cried and wept in certain circumstances, especially when those who are dearest to him had died. Also, what happened when the, and there's another narration, what happened with Usama bin Zayd, which is also in Bukhari. He said that, أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم انطلق إلى إحدى بناته ولها صبي في الموت فرفع إليه ونفسه تقع قع تقع قع كأنها شن ففاضت عيناه فقال سعد ما هذا يا رسول الله 
قال هذه رحمة جعلها الله في قلوب عباده وإنما يرحم الله من عباده الرحمة He said that the message of Allah that he went out he said to one of his daughters and she said that she had one youthful or, or someone of, of a baby or, or a youthful one that was, that was now suffering from the anguities of death when they were about to die and they were raised to him the youth or the young one or the youngling was raised to the message of Allah. He says, When nafsuhu ka'a shin. Fairly was shown this agonies of death. It was about to what? Die. And to the point where the message of Allah Sallallahu eyes start to become filled with tears. So Sa'id said, What is this, O Messenger of Allah? He said, What is this? You crying? He said, This is mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made in the hearts of people. Or in the hearts of the servants, excuse me. And Allah will have mercy upon those who show mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy upon those who what? Ar-Ruhama. Those who show mercy. So all of this from the benefits that we extracted is what everyone? What do we extract from this? Except that it's permissible to what? There's nothing wrong with weeping and crying during the time of sadness and grief. Or during the times of frustration in certain instances, as long as one says what pleases Allah to be with that. And he does not surpass the boundaries or transgress them. But remain in the realm of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated and we know that it's permissible to what? To show sadness and grief. And rather than we know that in certain, certain circumstances, this is a type of remedy for people. It's a type of remedy that they show remorse and that they show what? Sadness and that they do not hold it and that it shows and it gives some type of relief. Is it clear, everyone? G. So the next narration is we discuss, discuss from the authority of Anas ibn Malik, that it says that if Allah to be with the Allah that he wants, that if he wants good for, for his servant, he will hasten for him the punishment in this world. He will hasten for them the punishment for this, of this world. I thought they put that there. I'm sorry. Excuse me. What happened? Hmm. Oh, here it is. No. So this narration is to show the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warning for a slave what? Wanted for a slave, good. From those affairs that's been established as a characteristic of Allah, which is what they call irada. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has characteristics. From them are those sifat al the characteristics of his essence. From those characteristics of his essence is what everyone, what they call irada. Irada is sifat al it's not from Sifat al From what Allah Tabari with Ta'ala, from his characteristics of his essence, is what he intends to better with Ta'ala. No. Lahu al Hayatu wal Kalam wal Basal, Sam'un iradatun wa ilmun wa qtadar. That's what the Asha'ir was saying from the Sifat al that, which is also from the Sifat al Thatiyah. Just wanted to remind the review of poetry in my head. But anyway, from the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence is his irada. What Allah intends or what Allah wants. That's the characteristic of Allah. Is it from his what? Is it his actions, everyone? No. It's from the characteristics of his what? Essence. As you know, the characteristics of Allah's essence breaks down into two categories. The first category is the characteristic of what? His essence. The second one is the category, is what they call characteristic of his what? Actions. For an example of the characteristics of his essence is what, everyone? Example of what? Here. What they call what? Irada. What Allah intends. Or what Allah wants. Like, it says here, if Allah wants for his what? For his servant, good. He will hasten for him the punishment. The consequences in this world. 
طيب, as we discussed last class, we said that Allah تبارك وتعالى, out of His infinite wisdom, He سبحانه وتعالى allows certain things to happen, and all of it is considered from the affairs of in regards to Allah, what is good. Allah تبارك وتعالى, as we said, evil is not ascribed to Him at all. From the signs of which Allah سبحانه وتعالى wants for His slave, like we said, He hastes for him His punishment. Due to his sins, of what will happen in certain circumstances in people's lives when you see a life going left, you see your life going left. What do you mean? Meaning that you're not you're disobedient due to certain acts that you committed or you neglected it, or certain duties that you did not perform, or certain affairs that you committed, or certain sins that you committed. If a law was good for you. He will allow certain affairs to what? To afflict you. In order to what? In order to you return back to the truth. That's why it clearly says here in the hadith. What does it say, everyone? What does it say? Allah will hasten for the individual due to the sin he committed. What? The punishment in this world. You start to afflict him. Afflict him in certain matters. You see his life going left. He start to see problems in his car. Seeing problems in his wife. Certain things and certain signs that Allah is making clearly that you're coming up. Either you're being negligent in certain matters, or you're committing certain matters that are what that are displeasing to Allah. As a result of it, Allah starts to afflict his what his servant, in order for what out of the ultimate good, which is to bring him what back to the truth and to him to reflect, to return back to his his state of goodness and uprightness. So he will be what that he will be successful. So the fact that Allah afflicts him is a fair that is considered what everyone. خير, good. So that's what's intended in this particular narration here. Is it clear now, everyone? So a person, everyone said at the beginning, they was looking like, what do you mean? If, if Allah was good for a person, he hastens for him the punishment. In the beginning, it sounds bad, but once you explain it, oh yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> Is it clear, everyone? How many people we know out there that are in the sound, or excuse me, in the evil state? Then once they were tested. They were broke down completely until what? Until Allah subhanahu wa taala gave them tawfiq to what? In order to return back to the truth. And then we'll know. You'll find that Ibn Qayyim mentions, and I think it's Miftah Dar Dar Saada, that he mentioned that he mentioned about that Allah subhanahu wa taala will afflict a person, break him down, afflict him, and if he wants good for him, he'll have his heart to be remorseful for what he's done. That's all considered good for him. To have that severe, that that high, deep remorse of what what transpired, what happened, that he feels extremely sorry. Then Allah afflicts him and afflicts him and afflicts him and afflicts him until he breaks him down. Just utterly breaks the person down. Then, in this particular state, Ibn Al Qayyim mentions a tremendous benefit. He says here. He says, when a person now is broke down to this state, if Allah wants good for the individual, He takes them to another level of ubudiyah, <laughs> another level of ubudiyah, another level of what? Of, of, of servitude and slavery of Allah. He says to a level in which is called ubudiyah to toba, which is called the level of ubudiyah of, of repentance. Which is a tremendous state, which is better than a person who is what that didn't make tawbah, and they might be amazed or self amazement might have afflicted them, and they're being so called upright. <laughs> that person is better than him because he reached another level, which is called the ubudiyah to tawbah, the slavery or the what the servitude of tawbah. But that is a tremendous level. Why everyone that he said this is a high level? Because when you are now making tawbah, you've been broke down. You display a level of ubudiyah that is tremendous, because you're broke down and you humbling yourself in front of Allah now. Then that's what Allah wants, because you're truly manifesting the reason why you've been created in that particular instance, especially here when you've been broken down. Because now you figure you have in yourself, I have no way out. My worldly things haven't made me happy. My cars haven't made me happy. My wealth hasn't made me happy. My wife hasn't made me happy. My children hasn't made me happy. Or even you good. 
Even the haram fans haven't made me happy. My girlfriends haven't made me happy. None of my haram money has made me happy. Nothing has made me happy. I have no one left to turn to except Allah. I'm broke down now. Here in this instance, he said, the human being, the being truly manifests the reason why he's created. Because he's returning back to Allah and he's, he's coming down to Allah. As Sheikh Muhammad Aman Jami, he mentions, says, he says, فَهُوَ يَدْخُلُ عَلَى اللَّهِ مُنْكَسِرَ الرَّأْسِ مُنْكَسِرَ الْقَلْبِ خَافِضَ الرَّأْسِ بَدَلًا أَنْ يَدْخُلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ رَافِعَ الرَّأْسِ He said, because now he's entering upon Allah, broke down in his heart with his head humble. Instead of entering upon Allah with his head raised from someone who's ignorant and self amazed with themselves. Is it clear, everyone? So that's the reason why it says in these narrations, it says, for verily the dhunub, for the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish the person, especially with the dhunub that has emanated. As we know, there's no one that's protected and there's no one that's infallible except the prophets and the messengers, of course. And of course, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects. As Bani Adam, in which the great Imam, I'm not sure I'm mentioning this tremendous benefit, we'll go on. Which great Imam, Sheikh Salih Fawzah ibn Abdullah al Fawzah, he goes on to say about this, this benefit. He says, In regards to the human beings, everyone is fallible, except the prophets, because they've been excused from these type of errors or this, or this type of fallibility. As he, oh, we know the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu All of you are khatta. All of you make mistakes constantly. And the best of those who make mistakes is those who are what? Repentant. They follow up with, with repentance. And they try to make it right. They follow up with repentance and they try to make it right. For verily in human beings, it emanates from them a lot of sins. And a lot of affairs are in opposition. For if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for his servant, he will hasten for him the punishment based upon this disobedience in this world until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies him. So now he, he comes and he's upon his sin and Allah hastened for him the punishment until he's purified. Then he will move to the hereafter, or he will move on and transition to what? To the hereafter, and he has no sins upon him. And he enters paradise. So the fact that a person might be punished due to their sins is a form of what? Purification. So now we think that a person that's afflicted in certain cities and certain lands, where there are droughts and things of that nature, where people who are righteous, maybe Allah Taala wanted to what? Increase their reward and make it greater. No one knows the secret in the, in, of Allah Taala with the why, and the hikmah of why Allah Taala with the Allah conducts and administrates certain affairs within the creation. As we said, and we compared in the narration of Khidr and Musa, I keep re-emphasizing, where Khidr clearly said to Musa, after all those matters in which we said, where Musa kept thinking that everything that Khidr committed was something tremendous and something evil. Is that right now? I asked the last ayat so can cap. Until he kept what? Reprimanded Khidr, reprimanded him, and reprimanded him until Khidr clearly finally said, I told you you won't be able to be patient with me. This, from the narrations of which we'll find, I'll give, even bring the book of Tafsir of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab even mentioned. He said, from the benefits of that happened with Musa Khidr is to give us a glimpse of how, even on the level of the small knowledge that even Khidr had mentioned, that he said, my knowledge and the knowledge you've been given Musa, is no more than that woodpecker that stuck his beak in the ocean and put it out and pulled it out. That's the knowledge I've been given and you've been given. And Musa wasn't able to be patient based upon the knowledge that Musa had or, or that Khidr possessed, in which he wasn't able to stop saying, What did not or what did you do? Why did you do such and such? And then Khidr kept reminding him, Didn't I not tell you you wouldn't be able to be what? Patient with me. In order to reveal certain things that Allah preordained, that you deem to be evil. You would think, why would God allow that to happen to those individuals? As it said, it happened in the story of the boat. What happened, everyone? Of what name? With the boat in which Khidr had came upon the boat of those who were, who were poor people. And they were just minding their business, and he destroyed, or he damaged their boat until it was not able to move. Until Musa said, why did you do that? They were just in the innocent bystanders that you just damaged their boat. What did you do that for? 
And then he said, I told you I wouldn't be able to be patient with me. People would think that what? Oh, God isn't good. Why would he allow that to happen to those poor people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly giving us a glimpse of certain affairs of why he preordained certain matters. Until Khidr clearly explained at the end that I had damaged it for what? A reason of something good that was behind it. There was pirates coming in the back and every boat that they had seen, if it was in a sound state, they would plunder it and they would loot it. I rendered the damage in order to what? Protect them. So when they seen that the boat was damaged, they would leave it alone. They say you define that that was in the state in which Khidr was given of knowledge just more in certain affairs that Musa was not what? Given. And both of them both admitted at the end of the story that their knowledge that I've been given and the knowledge you've been given is no more than how that woodpecker put it in the sea and brought it out. If that's in comparison to what Khidr was given with Musa, how in the world can you think that you can, you can fathom what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he conducts in affairs of this existence of what we pertain to good and evil. How? When he was clearly comparing how the knowledge of what human beings are given is just a drink, a drink, a, a little drop of water in comparison to the vastness of the sea. And that is just an example of what was just to give us on the level of human beings to show the vastness of Allah, even though his knowledge is greater than that. Is it clear, everyone? A drop of water in comparison to the vastness of a sea. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is greater than that. Rather, it can, rather there's, no being, there's no ending to it. Then we're the first to say, why God allowed this to happen in such and such? How in the world could you say something like that? Due to the fact of lack of, of, of sense, lack of perfect belief, lack of corruption in, in the belief system. Is it clear, everyone? So this is the reason why we said this hadith. And this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows people to be afflicted even in the, in, the, in the state of disobedience and in a state in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with them. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly wants good for them, then what? He afflicts them. And that's the due to the ayah, as we know, in the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum, it's a Surah Al-Rum, I think. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما إش كسبت أيد الناس. He says, corruption has been as manifest in the, in the land of the sea due to what man has earned. That we make him taste some of what he's done. Why? In order for him to come back to the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly saying that he makes certain people what? Take, taste the what? The consequences of their actions in this world. And if Allah made them taste the full, as, as Ibn Kathir mentions in the tafsir of it, if Allah wanted to make us taste the full consequences, there wouldn't be nothing left on the earth. Everything would be destroyed. To the point where even those who crawl on the earth, as it says in the eye, wouldn't be left. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it off to a respite, or gives them respite to a specific time. But when the time comes, then what? There's no more left. And when Allah takes, and he's ready for his recompense and his punishment to come, no one can hold it back. Is it clear, everyone? Jay, we'll stop here. <laughs> Something I want to mention with Sheikh Islam mentioned. We'll talk about that next class. As far as the classes of brothers and sisters, we will continue the classes of what they are. It's not that many people that come to the class. If it gets severe, and I want everyone, and this is my advice to all of us, brothers and sisters, do not panic. Do not panic in these in what's taking the place around us. Whatever you do, do not panic. That's what the non-Muslims are hyping up. Do not panic. They're trying to render in a state of panic. And everyone to be in a state of panic. So everything could be chaotic for a reason. This benefits them. America is built upon chaos. America makes money upon confusion. And differing. And, uh, and so-called what they call... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? No, that's not it. That they, they make money based upon confusion and based upon uh, 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 what's the uh, what's head in my head, huh? Not that too manipulation, but based based upon there's always there's always different. Um, oh, I just had it in my head, huh? Conflict, conflict, confrontation, 
Hysteria. They make money off all this. That's how they make money. So keep in mind, do not panic, brothers and sisters. Do not panic. If, if anything happens in which will necessitate that we have to cancel classes to further notice, then it will be announced. But for now, everything will stay as far as the classic Kitab Tawheed. I'll say it again. Classes in Kitab Tawheed will continue of what is what will continue upon until further notice. It will it will continue. It will continue. If something major happens, or something of some urgent, it will be announced. But everybody, please, I'm asking them, and I and I am asking people, please do not panic. Don't panic. That's what they want you to do. They want you to panic. And as far as the intricates of of, of these affairs taking place, then is. Just brothers and sisters, just be patient. Make dua to Allah, then he keep you firm. But do not be in a state of panic, whatever you do. Because that's what, that's what they want you to do. Now all these affairs are taken by the qada and the qadr of Allah, and that's the reason why we're in this chapter. And Allah knows best, so why it's, it's really interesting of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preordained that this would be taking place and at the same time we're studying this chapter. Clear everyone? Okay. Okay. Any, any questions about the lesson? Tell that Javon. The Badahib. The affairs of blind fairs, blind, uh, when people blind follow. The their madhab and Hanafi or Shafi'i and the affairs of fiqh. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Just blind fanaticism. Mm -hmm. All those affairs are considered blind fanaticism. You tell them, type well, Imam Malik, why would you, even if that's the case, why would you want to pray in a manner when he was hurt? Why don't you pray in a manner when he was healthy? It doesn't make any sense, even if you wanted to use that as a delay. And even if they did pray like that, at the end of the day, we have Kitab al-Sunnah. Who's more awdah to be followed? Just who's more befitting that they follow? And not only do we say that, if it wasn't for Allah, and if it wasn't for the Kitab al-Sunnah, there wouldn't be no a'imma. There wouldn't be any a'imma. <laughs> so why wouldn't you go back to what has made the people Imams to be followed in the first place. It doesn't make any sense to me. Go back to what made them, that gave, that gave them that status in the first place. That's what you make your, your criteria, which you abide by and follow. It doesn't make any sense. But that's what I'm saying. Even the people of these days, we live in times people don't really. Once, once something blind fanaticism creeps in a person's heart, even the most simple affairs that make common sense really doesn't register with them. It doesn't, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up their insight to, for them to accept it. But you said this is certain things, that's like a no-brainer, of course. Why would I not follow what gave them status in the first place? That was, that was what makes sense. Why not go back to that? If it wasn't for Allah and this kitab of sunnah, there wouldn't be any a'imma. There wouldn't be anyone. There wouldn't be any ulama. There wouldn't be. So why would I go back to the, to the source that gave them the status in the first place and follow it? You understand? But like I said, just that's just basic one, two, three, but a lot of some people out there just do not comprehend it unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens their insight to accept it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all tawfiq. To follow. Or the sins, yeah, the sins of sin. It could be that too. Not necessarily. It could be either or. If a person is upon disobedience, and Allah is testing him or her, that could be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was good for him. Or if the person is righteous, it could be a state where a person is doing everything they could possibly do to obey Allah and they're still being tested. That could not, might not necessarily be a punishment for them. Or purification for them, but it could be that Allah just wants to raise their status. Mm -hmm. Such as, for example, the prophets and the messengers. 
Prophets of the message of the severe to people put the trial and test. And they were righteous, pure people. And they were the best in the heads and the masters of righteous people. And in spite of that, what do you find them? They had the hardest of lives. You gave me something. They had the hardest of and the most severest of trials and tests. Was that a punishment for them? We say no. It was ordered just to raise their status and raise their degree and reward in the hereafter. So it depends on what's the state of the individual. I'm sorry, I'm off. Uh huh. Uh huh. How do they translate in your book by the curiosity? I would say in 10 is probably better. In 10. That might be a bad translation for that. Intense bad. Hmm. Hmm. Let me look on that and I'm going to get back to you, inshallah. I'm all out of right now. But the word, that, that context like that doesn't. Intense bad? Yeah, that doesn't. What am I going to say? The Abd. I like another Mushkara again in the English. المشكلة يعني نريد أن نقرب المعنى في أذهان المتكلمين بالإنجليزية كيف نترجمه ترجمة مضبوطة إن شاء الله بإذن الله للدرس القادم سو أنا سأبحث وأعطيهم الجواب ولكن ما يحضر لي شيء ما يحضر لي شيء أنا ما في كوزم الله عيدنا let's wait till the next class Sunday alright but the ten evil if he wants for a slave he intends for a slave evil just give me a minute anything else Anything else, anyone? About the about the lesson? I had to give you the electrolyte powder, both of you. طيب وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شنو لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وتبيلك.